Welcome to this special program. Today we're here with the Minister of Natural Resources, the Honorable Raphael Trotman, to discuss issues in the natural resources sector. Minister, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. A lot me. has been happening under your ministry and a lot of the focus has been on the oil and gas industry. But before we come there, Minister, let's discuss the other sectors, particularly mining. Um, can you tell us, it's, it's mid-year, how has that sector been doing? Well, I can say uh, we've been doing relatively well. Uh, weather has posed a problem. I think we've had more rainfall or coming much earlier than anticipated. But that aside, uh, we found that if I can start with gold, which is uh, really the the one resource that is holding the economy together right now and on which we depend quite a bit. As of the end of June, which would be six months, we were at about 318,000 ounces which would, by extrapolation, tell us that we are going to come close to the 700,000 mark. And of course, I believe we are going to meet it, but I remain optimistic and don't want to say definitively, but the point is we will come within the targets that the Minister of Finance set at the beginning of the year in the, uh, in the last budget uh, that was presented. So gold is holding its own. It is also telling us that despite the naysayers and the uh, detractors who are saying that uh, the, some of the measures that were introduced by government are hurting the industry, that we're really not seeing that. So, you know, lies and then there are statistics. Uh, so the statistics are showing that we are uh, performing relatively uh, in the same manner as we did last year. But that's not to say, and I'm, and I'm saying it here now, that we're not still looking for ways to bring some new measures, some relief, uh, some incentives to the mining industry. And I hope to be meeting with the head of the GRA and the minister, again, we met with the heads of the mine, GGDMA, the Gold and Diamond Mines Association, and the Ghana Women Miners Organization recently, held very good discussions, and we hope to continue that before we finalize budget 2018. So gold is doing uh, well. I can say about bauxite, uh, we are doing uh, much better, I believe, uh, than we did last year, and I think largely due to the increase in demand coming out of China. So that has helped. and. Uh, uh, coming alive of the global economy, so to speak. However, rain has affected us, and I can tell you that, for example, Rusal had to close off some mining for a few weeks because the pits were flooded. So that has been a problem for us. Um, Bosai, the Chinese company, has also bought into the old manganese mine. So work is afoot to start uh, preparing for production in, uh, later this year and um, we'll start to prepare and hopefully if not at the end of 2018 certainly in 2019 we will start production of manganese. Insofar as the forestry uh, is concerned that again is going uh, relatively well and we are on target um, to, to, to bring in good um, earnings from foreign exchange and most importantly we are hoping to sign what is known as the EU FLECT, a, a voluntary partnership agreement with the European Union this year, and that will give us full access into the European market. We've seen some exporters being able to get green heart into the United Kingdom, which is a good sign, which shows and tells us that it is possible if we do the right thing. So we're hoping to invite experts and the state officials from the UK to Guyana to hold perhaps a workshop so that our exporters of green heart can know how to bring themselves in order. So the extractive industries themselves are doing well and the ministry has also started, I wouldn't say that we're fully into it, but we've started to look as w at water as a resource uh, in the future. I think we've grown accustomed to seeing water just running down to the oceans and going away. But in many countries, there's no such luxury. Uh, and some of them are right here in the Caribbean. Barbados and Antigua, for example, are growing very dry. And so we are exploring ways in which uh, for our own benefit, we can conserve water, ensure that it is safe and drinkable and clean, and of course free from contaminants such as minerals like mercury and cyanide, but also the turbidity of the water from mining is, is not affecting water in communities. So more emphasis is going to be placed on water, but the Ministry of Communities still remains the main and primary ministry for water, but we are going to come alongside to see how we can give support. Let's start with the water uh, mining if I may call it that. Um, what role exactly will the Ministry of Natural Resources be playing? And um, you said you're exploring it. Mm -hmm. Exactly where are we with that exploration? Well, of course, we're looking, one at, looking to see where our headwaters are, where are our natural waters coming from to ensure that those are not polluted. Recently, Cabinet made a determination that an application for mining 
would not be permitted um, in an area known as Parish Peak, which is upper Demerara going towards Burbies, uh, because the headwaters of the Demerara River um, are right there. We are talking about a green state, a green economy, and greening and uh, respecting our environment and biodiversity. So that's one area. So we have to ensure that where mining is taking place, that the waters are not uh, or kept, pollution is kept to a minimum. There is going to be some disruption, but we need to keep those uh, disruptions to a minimum. Also, we're looking to see where there are catchment areas. So, for example, even now, we are working uh, with the regional administration of Region 9 to create a large uh, dam um, because last year there was severe drought and uh, dry season, some said drought, in Region 9. Even though this year you would never believe it because they're uh, inundated uh, by water. But certainly what happened before is going to happen again. And so we have uh, constructed a large uh, earthen dam um, by, done by the GR uh, uh, construction. The, they have one at their uh, facilities. And we are ensuring that um, we do want to provide relief for central Rupununi. And the expectation is that we'll have another in um, South Rupununi. So at least in the dry season, communities will have access to water. So that's what's happening right now. That uh, catchment area in the Rupununi, um, has that been completed to, to be able is, to benefit from these the rain? The is done. In fact, the dam is quite filled and I am due to make a visit sometime in early August. In fact, I should have gone in before, but because of the flooding there, um, it might sound strange to be visiting a dam with water when you have too much water. So. We will be paying a visit um, in August to look at that dam. And then, of course, as I said, we're working with the regional administration and inviting Conservation International to also provide some guidance in terms of the environmental and social management of the resource. Coming back to the forestry uh, industry, you said it's doing well. Um, can you give us in sort of like a comparison to last year, how well it's doing? Well, uh, in terms of the numbers, uh, the last figure I knew that we had pulled in about $19 million um, US in terms of royalties, etc., which um, is less than it was a few years ago. But a few years ago, we did have one company in particular just moving our logs out of Ghana. We've cut back on that. And we the emphasis now is more on sustainable development, uh, sustainable use of our forests. So Guyanese can expect less logs being shipped out. We are working with Barama. We've recently um, identified some companies to take over the former Barama concession, and we hope to be able to, to give those out uh, relatively soon. We are as well tightening up in terms of companies that have been delinquent in paying fees, etc. And uh, all in all, I, I'd like to say that things are relatively stable in the forestry sector, and we are in the process of having a consultancy done to um, to revamp the national forest policy and what is known as the forest statement. So I expect that those reports will be with us around August, maybe by September, and then we can, it can help us to formulate policy a little better. Now, uh, value-added production in forestry has been a push of the government. Um, how are efforts moving along to get companies to, to buy into it? Well, there's great interest uh, in adding value, and we are working to improve the kind of products that we produce, you know. Um, we can do better in terms of our sawn, uh, sawn uh, lumber, for example, and the, the dressing of our woods. And this is why, for example, uh, pine wood is landed in Guyana and competing against and outselling some of our local species. It shouldn't be. So I'm looking to see how I can give the local market an, a Philip an incentive by putting some restrictions. And I, and I say restrictions, as we're not going to ban pine wood, but certainly pine wood shouldn't be landed in Ghana from elsewhere and be selling at a cost cheaper than our local timbers. However, the, the, uh, our local loggers have to raise the bar, not just provide uneven measurements and crude cuts, because pine wood comes nicely played, it's easy to work with, it's light. Uh, and so uh, we're working with that and we work with the Ministry of Communities because the government's housing program, which is about to come on the stream, we expect that certainly the roofing, banisters, floors, uh, window frames, etc., uh, will be used, uh, wood will be used. And so we expect that there is going to be a surge in demand and we want to know that and to ensure that uh, we meet national expectations. Has the, has the industry or loggers been approaching the ministry for capacity building to help them improve the quality that they're offering in terms of value added? Well, there are workshops being done by the Guyana Forestry Commission, which is an agency coming out to the ministry and, and they've been benefiting. Recently, 
we had a workshop very well attended and very well participated in on lesser used species of woods. Everyone wants to go for green heart or purple heart or um, kabakali. But there are a number of other woods which, when you look at their density and their applications, are just as good. Uh, and in some instances can work even better for furniture making, for cabinet, uh, cabinetry, or for flooring than say green hard, but we've grown very accustomed uh, to certain woods. And so there are good woods which can do the same or even a better job than the very famous species, and you can get them at a lesser price. So we found that the response has been good and, and um, we're seeing greater use of these lesser used species. Minister, coming back to mining, mm -hmm. and particularly gold mining, and the the impact that it has or the contribution it makes to our country's GDP and you mentioned they've been doing well for the mid-year so far. Um, what are some efforts? Well I know the ministry was looking at the syndicate project for particularly smaller miners. How has that uh, project mm -hmm. been going? Well the syndicates um, are being formed. Minister Brooms is really headlining and um, taking care of that. However I recently held a meeting with the senior staff of the GGMC we're going to allocate to each syndicate, and I believe there are 12 in number, 10 blocks. A block is equal to about 1,200 acres of land, so it's a lot of land. So each syndicate gets about 12,000 acres of, um, of land, and they will use that as a pilot, and then we'll see how they can utilize those, how they organize themselves. We have found a few instances, and they're in the very minority of some internal issues with the syndicate, because when you put people together, you put value, you put organization, you, some people do all the work and some want to benefit, etc. But government wants to make these lands available, and we expect that by uh, between August and September, we'll start the allocations. Uh, GGMC has been instructed to write to the syndicates, informing them that the 10 blocks are available. We've done the mapping and they're to identify exactly where they'd like to have their lands. Um, and while I'm at it, I can mention Marudi Mountain, which is a vexed area, it's very, uh, very far, deep south of Guyana. And so I visited recently, and we do have a mediation process which is holding, but it, it's just, um, showing some signs of buckling under the strain between the company and the cemetery miners who uh, it was agreed would be allowed to continue to mine there. So efforts are afoot now to relocate those center miners to some new areas that we want to open up and to form a syndicate in that area so that they, the company can be free of having to um, have miners on its land and they can work freely and also the miners themselves won't have to rely on a company to give them a space but they'll have their own lands and um, we're working on that and I intend to have that done before the end of 2017. Are the miners res uh, reciprocating to the offer for new oh, land? Yes, I think at the end of the day they want to work, they want to earn, they want to have a, a decent chance of, of a good life and so working on somebody else's spot and, and uh, being um, blame for different things is not comfortable, comforting for them and neither is it for the company to have to accommodate them. So I think the idea of setting aside a few blocks, maybe one or two blocks for the center miners um, is resonating well and as I said I, I intend to have it done for them um, very soon. Minister, recently the Guyana Gold and Diamond Miners Association raised their concern about the possible neglect of mining in light of the new oil and gas industry. Do you want to address that? I would say yes, I'm aware of the uh, complaint. Indeed, oil and gas does get a lot of attention and it's not that the government is necessarily placing that attention. I think the nation is all caught up and rightly so with the coming prospects of um, oil production in 2020. Gold and Diamond Mines Association, they do have some genuine grouses, for example, the roads, uh, we need to, need to do better, but as I said, the rains came much earlier and much heavier than we anticipated this year, and uh, we've kind of separated the function of road building and, and road repairs from, previously GGMC did have a role, and we would be able to do some emergency works, and uh, that has been passed over to Ministry of Public Infrastructure. Minister Patterson and I continue to work, and I believe um, we've agreed now that the GGMC will have a greater role, but uh, his ministry, public infrastructure, will, will be the main um, build of roads. Outside of that, as I said, the statistics show that production continues to be on or same um, as it was in 2016. So the grounds that government is not aiding the industry, we're not, we're not seeing evidence of it. We know there are from some frustrations, and I want to say that on a daily basis, I grant so many concessions very quietly, uh, waivers of fees and of penalties, and some of them add up to millions. So the state has, we have been doing our best at the ministry here to make life, to, to level the playing field. So while we may have um, taken away some concessions for heavy equipment, 
We still give concessions for ATVs. We give concessions for fuel. Uh, we've been given out mining lands, and many miners have been writing the minister. The minister does have power to waive grant waivers of um, penalties owed, or um, to give extensions for payments of fees. And I would say nine out of ten times I grant. Some of them are repeat persons, and I have a few on my desk now who are asking for more time, and they they write final application. And so we've been doing that. So. Apart from what is seen in the public, we've been doing our best to, to give aid. And uh, the Minister of Finance and I met, as I said, with the leadership of the GGDMA and the Women Miners Organization um, quite recently. We are the took to work with them. And before Budget 2018 is settled, we are going to meet with them again to see what we can do. Government does not intend and does not want um, the economy to rest solely on oil in a few years because that is going to be disastrous. It's known as a resource course where you take everything, put all your eggs into one basket, you pay the price for it. Mining has been a part of life for, Gu for Guyana. We want it to continue to be so. This is where El Dorado is and El Dorado was not... Uh, so Walter Raleigh wasn't looking for oil, he was looking for gold. We just want to make sure that miners respect the communities in which they work in terms of how they mine. Uh, making sure that they don't pollute the waters, that the issues of drugs and guns and prostitution and trafficking, these are the downsides, the social ills that come with mining that we have to manage and miners themselves have to own up to and help government to eradicate some of them. We want to ensure that there are available lands that have good yields because I've known when I became minister of complaints where people were given mining lands on top of mountains or in sandy or swamp areas that they could not mine. So we're doing geological surveys to ensure that if we say to you that um, you've put in an application for this spot, that this spot has a fairly good chance of giving you good rates of return on your investment rather than you going in with an excavator and in a few weeks going bust and can't pay your loan and losing your house and your family is in disarray. So it takes two to tango and we, we are willing to work with them. We continue to work with them and yes, of course, there are going to be some moments when oil may get a little more attention and there are going to be times when mining gets more attention than oil. It is my job as minister and with Minister Boob to keep that balance. So we're not unmindful of their uh, concerns. Uh, and we are doing our best to meet them. Turning our attention to the much talked about oil and gas, mm -hmm. the, now we know that the government has undertaken a series of um, reviews and implementation of new laws and policies. Mm -hmm. How has that been going and, and what are some new legislation or policies we'll see coming on stream? Well indeed, uh, since 2015 we have been working uh, overtime to, um, to boost capacities and uh, in particular the policy uh, level we've been getting experts, getting expert opinions, meeting with people, getting to know them, and also boosting capacity in terms of our legal and regulatory framework. So, uh, in the main, the Commonwealth Secretariat uh, has been doing a lot of um, work for us, and we must compliment them. Drafting, so we've drafted in, uh, in one instance some new laws. Uh, one is the public, um, the Petroleum Commission Bill, which is currently in Parliament and. Uh, the ads have been put out in the papers so members of the public to give their opinions. The government doesn't say that it knows everything. We have a view which we've put into Parliament, but we've asked for other views to come. And at the end of the day, we hope to have a bill that is nationally acceptable. Um, alongside that, um, we've also drafted a sovereign wealth fund uh, bill, the Commonwealth Secretariat. We had it done um, with the help and guidance of Ministry of Finance, and we've since sent it over to the Ministry of Finance. And the Minister has said, that it is currently undergoing and has undergone some reviews by um, undergone rather some reviews by the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the IMF, and a few other experts. And so, it is his expectation that by the end of 2017, he could bring that bill to the public. Uh, we have not yet begun uh, producing oil, and so there's no revenue. I did see some kind of misguided statement attributed to Mr. Jagu. I don't believe. Uh, that what I read could be true, that we should have set up the law a long time ago. Now, the law is needed so that when production starts in 2020, we can have um, a regime to manage the revenue. But if there's no revenue, um, I'm finding it strange that, and, and I believe that uh, he's going to come up with a correction to say that he, was, he did not mean what I think the press is trying to say. He said that we should have had a, the law two years ago because there's no oil revenue for a fund to, to put into a fund. So what we are doing now is ensuring that by 2020, we will be ready almost with a basket to ensure that we don't lose um, valuable revenue. For persons who uh, have expressed concern over um, 
where Guyana is getting some of its guidance from. Mm -hmm. um, how do you address that? You did mention we've gotten assistance from the uh, IMF, the World mm -hmm. Bank, Commonwealth, mm -hmm. and such. Guyanese are known for, very famous throughout the Caribbean for being the be experts at everything. On a per capita basis, I think we have the highest concentration of experts in the world. Uh, for a country with less than a million people, everyone knows. I mean, whether it be cricket, whether it be oil and gas, whether it be mining, whether it be running the police force or right now the prison service, they can tell you exactly who to put where and what to do. There's only so much that the government can do. There's only so much advice they can take at any one time. And on, on any given day, we are receiving advice from the IMF, the World Bank, the Petroleum Institute of Mexico, the government of Chile, the United Nations Development Program, we're receiving uh, support from the U.S. State Department's Energy Governance Capacity Initiative, the Government of Canada, um, to name a few. We have Dr. Mangal with us. So there's no shortage of experts. What we cannot do is allow everyone who says he or she is an expert, and we're not saying that they're not, to come to tell us what to do. Because I can tell you that I sit, sit in many meetings, and much of what is said to me is really repetition of what has been said the week before. So we spent most of 2016 meeting experts and then in 2017 we've decided who we're going to be working with and we can in these stages and in these days only be listening to a few voices we cannot listen to 100 voices and unfortunately everyone who has a voice wants to be heard and that's their right but at the end of the day when it comes to making decisions and moving the agenda forward we have got to streamline who we're taking advice from and and when and right now we have a cadre of strong advisors most of them are overseas based advising us and we are relying on that advice and we are doing relatively well i'm not saying that we are perfect in every uh, material way but i would say that we are on point to where we ought to be recently we hired a, a world fa a very renowned firm worldly parsons out of mm -hmm. out of australia to advise government on the de on exxon development plan we didn't attempt to do this alone we went as far as australia one of the world's two best in the world uh, we hired that company. So this is the advice we are relying on. Uh, and Minister Jordan, the fiscal end, the, the fi financial end, I know that we, every day, if uh, we either have World Bank people here, their, their best economists, IMF, or Inter-American Development Bank's economists and financiers and experts are advising us as well. So I would like to say to Guyanese that we hear you. Uh, government is receiving advice it is not coming from within the cabinet we are receiving the advice from abroad there's only so much advice we can take at the time and all of it from what we've been able to say is consistent so the experts all say the same thing and we have begun putting things in place minister finally we know exxon is it currently carrying out its first phase development but there are other companies here that are, are working yeah. can you just give us an update on where they are well yes uh, there are a number of other companies i think all of us, including um, myself as minister and, this, and the staff of the ministry, become fixated with Exxon and Lisa. But we're talking about an entire offshore basin known as the Guyana Basin. And uh, there's a lot of work and activity happening. So there's Repsol, Spanish company. There's Tolo, a British company. There's Anadarko, uh, American company, which had an incident a few years with our neighbor. But they've signaled their intention to re-engage. Um, and uh, a lot of Chevron has um, shown an interest, a number of other companies have shown an interest. So there's seismic work, which is surveys, where you do sounding, almost like an ultrasound. Um, and so companies are engaged in seismic work. Exxon is the furthest ahead because they're preparing for production, but other companies are doing seismic work. And um, there's great, in fact, it's beyond great. There's tremendous interest in what is happening in Ghana. Whenever you go to conferences or meetings abroad, everyone wants to come to, the, to, um, to become involved. And so we anticipate that quite outside of the laser development, we are going to have an oil industry that is going to take us into the next 75 to 100 years. And so we have to prepare nationally and we are excited about the prospects of the future. All right then, thank you, thank Minister. You very much. Okay. And there you have it, a brief update on what's been happening in the natural resources sector. Thank you for joining us. I'm Tiffany Roaches.